or tape, CDs, DVDs, or our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. First evening, July the 5th, 1990. Summer family camp meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Jack Harris is the speaker of the evening. But it was a, really a, a privilege last night for me to have both Colonel Speed Wilson and Jack Harris here together yesterday. And uh, Jack, he doesn't have much problem right now, but if I, I felt like if I could have got my chest big enough, I'd have popped all my buttons on. <laughs> I was thrilled to have, to be honored with both of their presence last night, the presence of Colonel Speed Wilson and Jack Harris to be here on the 4th of July, to be here to minister to us yesterday. But it's a joy and a pleasure to have Brother Harris come and be part of this campground, and be part of the uh, governing body of this place, and to come and minister the word of the Lord as the Lord reveals unto him the, the word for the hour and the day that we live in. And it's a joy to have Jack with us to minister tonight. Praise the Lord. Thank the Lord. I'm happy to be here. Thank the Lord. As Brother, Brother Golden said, the Apostle Peter gave us all an opening statement on the mountain of transfiguration. He couldn't think of anything else to say, and he said, it's good to be here. And ever since then, the Pentecostal-oriented preachers have used that phrase. <laughs> Hallelujah. And it is indeed a good one, isn't it? Thank the Lord. Oh, I, I sense the presence of the Lord in the tabernacle this evening. Praise the Lord. I, I sense the profound, His profound presence. Hallelujah. Would you just close your eyes with me a moment and we'll lift our hands and just praise Him that's worthy of all praise. Hallelujah. Praise the lovely Lord Jesus for His wonderful goodness toward us. Oh, thank God forever. Our God reigns. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hey, blessed be the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, wonder of wonders, our Lord and our God. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Yea, hear the word of the Lord, for the Lord speaks profoundly and directly to thee tonight, saying, Yea, uh, surely you have received many blessings, surely much deliverance has been wrought, yea, and you've sat in the realm of the Shekinah glory of your God. Yea, I tell you also, my people, that you have received some good instructions since you have come to this meeting. Hey, and if thou uh, shall observe these instructions and shall allow them to come become a part of your life, I shall liken you unto a man that built his house on a rock. And the rains uh, poured, the hail fell, the wind blew, the lightning flashed, 
Yea, but that house stood, for it was indestructible, saith the Lord thou God. But on the other hand, if thou should hear a true word from God, yea, uh, and neglect it and ignore it, I would liken you then to a man that built his house on sand. Yea, and it stood in splendor for a while, but then come the rains, uh, the winds, the lightnings, the hails flashed, uh, and the wind blew, and that house was destroyed, and great was the destruction. But I know that it shall not be so with you, for you are my people, and I have called thee, yea. I have handpicked thee, as it were, saith the Lord thou God. Yea, and I have chosen thee, and called thee out, uh, and not uh, just to be idle, but for a purpose, saith the Lord thou God. Yea, I know that you will be an obedient uh, people, because I know that you will be taught saith the Lord thou God. Yea, uh, for I see the hungering in your hearts, yea, and know that it reaches the heart of God. Yea, I see your hungering, and I know your desire uh, to follow on after me. I tell you that desire shall not leave you until I bring deliverers upon Mount Zion, saith the Lord thou God. Yea, and then shall thou see mass deliverance as you have never seen it before, uh, saith the Lord thou God. Uh, for then shall I begin uh, to deal with all the chaff, yea, yea, and I shall begin uh, to search for the last spot, yea, saith the Lord thou God, and I shall quicken you through your spirit, yea, and I shall call uh, uh, defects uh, that are now in thee to your attention, yea, and you shall say unto me, I confess that I am guilty, Lord, deal with me, cleanse me, O Lord, uh, wash me with hyssop, and I shall be white as snow. I shall be as pure uh, as holiness, saith the Lord thou God. Yea, uh, for only a people that are hungry for my presence, only a people uh, that wants to be called by my name, only a people that wants to apprehend that for which they were apprehended for, uh, would even uh, come as you have come, saith the Lord thou God. Yea, of, of hot uh, pavement thou hast driven, yea, and you have, yea, and ye shall not uh, leave as ye come, saith the Lord thou God. Ye shall not appoint it, for the Lord thou God shall teach you his ways, uh, saith the Lord, and ye shall know uh, that you are the chosen, that you are the uh, elect or the very elect of the elect, saith the Lord thou God. I tell you uh, that you are a candidate uh, for sonship this night, because you have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, yea, and you have the Spirit of the Almighty God uh, living within you. I tell you again, greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. I tell you now that you are a real people in a real warfare against a real enemy over a real truth, saith the Lord thou God. Yea, uh, you will remember that the Apostle Paul has written uh, that I am set for the defense of the gospel. I tell you now, if your spiritual eyes were open, yea, and you should see uh, what an attack uh, that the church of the living God is really under, how much conspiracy there is uh, in various realms, uh, yea, in the political systems, yea, but not only in the political systems and in the systems of the church, if you could see all that is poised, uh, yea, to make war against uh, the church, you too would be set for the defense of the gospel. I tell you now, uh, in a manner of speech, it would be time to circle the wagons, uh, yea, and get ready to defend the gospel of the kingdom. I tell you again uh, that he that is in you is greater than he uh, that is charging down on you, uh, saith the Lord thou God. You must maintain an awareness of this, and you will be good soldiers of Jesus Christ, uh, saith the Lord. Yea, and I shall uh, say of you, this is my son, and you shall say of me, thou Thou art my Father, yea, and I shall draw thee closely uh, unto me, saith the Lord. Yea, and I shall uh, teach you in your ear. Yea, I shall show you by the sight of the spiritual eye. Yea, I shall enable thee to bypass uh, the natural senses. Yea, and I shall revive uh, the spiritual senses. Yea, that was lost in the fall, saith the Lord. But I'm restoring. Yea, it is a day of restoration. If you would be restored, say, Here am I, Lord. Lord, yea, uh, and the 
Lord, I will take count uh, of your uh, presence and of your name. Uh, yea, uh, and the Lord will surely, uh, when he is blessing others, he will not pass over, yea, and pass you by, uh, saith the Lord. Yea, for you are privileged people uh, to be in the presence of this ministry, the ministry of this body that has gathered together, the ministry uh, that governs this body uh, that is gathered together even here this night. I tell you, your God is a God of order. Yea, and that order is divine order. Yea, I am a God uh, that sets. Uh, yea, I am a God that plucks up. Yea, pulls down. Yea, and, and uproots. But I am also a God uh, that sets, and I set everything in order. Yea, I tell you now uh, that I am moving upon the ministry that I have called. Yea, I know that not all uh, that are called ministry in the land this night are called by me. Yea, uh, but those that I have called, yea, them that I have justified, yea, I'm putting a hungering in their heart, and I'm putting a revelation in their spirit, yea, and I'm teaching them the ways of God uh, as I have not another generation, uh, saith the Lord of glory. Yea, I tell you now, do not sit idly by. Yea, but if I, if you feel the workings, the unworkings of the Spirit, you will hear voices that others don't hear. Ah, uh, you, uh, yea, uh, thou will uh, have feelings that others don't feel, and you will know of an assurance uh, that you're in the presence of God. Yea, and that you are numbered among those uh, that shall attain unto the high calling, uh, saith the Lord the God. Yea, do not delay Delay. Uh, it is time for ministry. It is a time to rise up uh, and take the kingdom. Uh, for know uh, that the kingdom of God has suffered violence, and the violent does take it by force. Saith the Lord, I speak to you uh, of a godly force, as you know, saith the Lord. Yea, my government shall not fail. Yea, my love shall not fail. Yea, uh, my, uh, I shall begin, yea, I shall begin to teach you about timing and placing and execution, uh, saith the Lord, thou God. Yea, for I shall bring thee uh, into a body of people. Yea, and thou show that you are not alone. Thou shall know uh, that you stand not alone, uh, and that you have not been weakened by the processes of the enemy uh, that has launched an attack against the church. For uh, do you not recall that I said uh, to the apostles of old, Rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell uh, shall not prevail against it? I tell you that is true, as uh, true tonight as it was uh, when the Lord spoke it. Yea. I have safeguarded, I tell you now, uh, that every move, everything that has transpired, yea, has been within the timing uh, and the placing of the Almighty. Yea, and I know well where we are uh, on my timetable and on the map of the Almighty tonight. I can pinpoint your position. I know exactly uh, where you are. I know exactly where the church is. I speak of the church as a universal uh, body of Christ. Yea, ah, yea, for know that I am not too taken up uh, in denominations and sectarianism. Yea, uh, but wherever there is a sincere heart, and wherever uh, there is divine order, and wherever the revelation of God flows uh, into your heart and into your mind and into your spirit, you are my people. Yea, and it is I uh, that is quickening you. Yea, it is I that is quickening you. Yea, and making you alive. Ye alive, uh, not to the world, but alive unto God. I tell you now uh, that the law of the Spirit of life in Jesus uh, will set you free uh, from the law of sin and death. Yea, and thou shalt arise and come up to a higher law. Yea, and be governed uh, by a higher law. I uh, say it, the Lord, thou God. Yea, for it is the Lord that speaketh, and who is he that can gainsay? For if God be for us, who is he that can be against us? For if he that spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Oh, the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves 
rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break his bands from us. Let us cast his cords asunder. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. He shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king in my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I'll give you the heathen for thine inheritance in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt rule them with a rod of iron. Dash them in pieces as a potter's vessel. Hear ye kings, and be wise, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you, and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all them that do put their trust in the Lord. Lord, how art thy priests that trouble me? Many there be that rise up against me. Many there be that say of my soul, There is no help for him in God. But thou, Lord, art my shield and my glory, and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid me down and slept, and I awaked, for the Lord sustained me. I won't be afraid now if ten thousand people gather themselves together against me. Rise up, my Lord, save me, my God. Thou hast known mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongeth to thee. And thy blessings are upon all your people. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that you care. Thank you for your caring, O Lord. Oh, thank you for your love, Lord. Thank you for your love. We sing a chorus, oh, for the love like the love of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. We, uh, and what is the love of God? Ah, uh, well, you remember on that mem memorable occasion when Jesus had gathered with his disciples for the, what's called the last supper, the last gathering? He said, one of you is going to betray me. Mm. And... They listened, you know, the table was rather long, and some of them were a good distance from him, and Peter leans over on John and says, did I misunderstand him, or did he say that one of us was going to betray him? So, yeah, that's what he said. Oh, my. Uh, isn't it amazing? The Bible says that Jesus needed not that any man tell him what was in the mind of man, for he knew all men. It tells in the opening uh, that Jesus knew that it was Judas, who was going to betray him together uh, for months, months. And the apostles had observed Jesus' action and reaction toward each apostle. And not one of the apostles suspected Judas. Right. Having loved his own, it says in the 13th chapter of St. John, where this story told, having loved his own, he loved them until the end. Well, I thought, boy, that's, that's, I don't know if I could do that or not. Could I travel with 12 men that were supposed to be loyal to me and loyal to my cause, knowing full well that one of them was trying to run a conspiracy against me, going to stab me in the back, so to speak, going to betray me? Could I... Uh, wouldn't it show up somewhere down the road? I mean, wouldn't I probably let it show up somewhere? That, that I had something with Judas here. But, but it didn't show up, did it? That's our blessed Lord. Oh, I tell you, the, uh, Isaiah said his image was marred more than any other man's. I realize that the first meaning there probably speaks of the cross and the whipping post and all of these things. But I tell you, it means more than that. It means the portrayal of him now is marred more than the life or the portrayal of any other or infamous person. Praise the Lord. Isn't it amazing? I'm going to read, if you want to uh, read with me, from Ephesians chapter 4. And, uh, and for a few minutes, uh, uh, whatever, we'll, uh, we'll expound some maybe and, uh, and try to teach you some. 
there's one thing about teaching at Lake Hamilton, you you don't have to be too careful because if you got a revelation from the Lord, because see, if you wasn't hungry, you wouldn't come to Lake Hamilton. If you didn't know what God was doing, you wouldn't even come here, would you? So I got a good class. I know in the opening that you want what God has. And that's all I want for you. I have no other motive. No, this is my only motive. I, I didn't ask God to call me into the ministry. I didn't ask him to. I'm glad he did, but, but I didn't ask him to. I, I never ask him for any position in ministry. I never ask him. He, I'm glad for what he has given me and how he has placed me, how he has led me, but I never ask him to do it. The choosing is his. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Amen. And that makes him, I, I like it that way because that makes him responsible. <laughs> I like I like to think that uh, God is responsible for this guy. You know, see? And, yeah. Amen. And, um, so, and another thing, too, I'm continual. I, I never demand that you believe everything that I believe just the way I believe it. If you will not demand me to believe everything that you believe just the way that you believe it. If you persist to argue with me, I have to give you the privilege of being wrong. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now, now we got acquainted. <laughs> now, I think most of you know me and have uh, known my ministry. Uh, if you if you follow if you follow the the message that I preach and the ministry that God uh, brings through me, it'll never hurt you. I will never hurt you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'll never make any false claims. I'll never defraud you. I'll never take anything through false pretense. I'll never ask you for anything. Hallelujah. Amen. And that has been a long-standing policy with me from the very beginning. That's the way the Lord has led me. He may not have led you the same way. He doesn't deal with all of us the same way. He has a variety of ministries I'm about to read to us here. Let's do. In the seventh... Um, uh, well, let's begin with the seventh verse, I guess, in the fourth chapter of, of uh, Ephesians. Did I say Ephesians? All right. Yeah, this is a real familiar passage to us that have, uh, may not be familiar to some. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Uh, now, uh, let me pause here long enough to say uh, that he, all right, he gave... He gave these, this five, we call this a five-fold ministry, and, um, and, and then he tells us what he gave it for. He gave it for the perfecting of the saints. You see, God gave the five-fold ministry for the perfecting of the saints. Yeah. One lady I was talking to uh, up in uh, Virginia just recently, and I asked her where well, so I'm not from anywhere in particular. So I, I said, so what do you do? So I just go around and try to keep the preacher straight. Said, oh, got any help? <laughs> well, you know, God will keep the... Uh, God will perfect the five-fold ministry, and the five-fold ministry uh, will be for the perfecting of the saints. You have to worry about perfecting the ministry. Amen. Just worry about letting the ministry perfect you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. I'm subject to all ministry. I submit to all ministry. When I'm submissive to Glenn, he, whatever he says, I'll do. And, uh, and, and whatever decisions he makes, uh, I stand with him. 
Uh, without question, I just stand with him. Whatever kind of decision he makes while I'm here uh, during a, a meeting, I stand with him. I mean, I'm, I'm with Glenn. He is the uh, he is the priest over this uh, campground and over this meeting. He is he is equivalent to though he didn't call this church, but he's equivalent to a pastor. The pastor is the highest order in the church. Nobody in the church. Nobody is above the pastor. And when an apostle visits uh, a church, he is subject to the pastor. Though he, he has a higher, he is in a higher ministry, greater ministry, but he submits to the pastor. Everybody is subject to the pastor. Brother James said uh, in the council at Jerusalem, he said, my sentence is this. That was the final decision. The apostles and elders had been in a discussion, and James said, My sentence is this. James was the pastor. He had the last word. He had veto power. Uh, this, uh, it is amazing uh, what the church, the, you know what the church is teaching us? And what the Bible is teaching us is not the same thing. The church is teaching us to get ready to die, and the Bible is teaching us to get ready to live. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, uh, you want to know what my blessed hope is? Hallelujah. Well, I, I, uh, my blessed hope was when I first came, I came through the old Pentecostal order, and my first hope was uh, when I first got saved, I, and I was very young, but I hoped I'd die and go to heaven. That's a good hope. Uh, but I don't, that's not my hope now. <laughs> I found a more blessed hope than that. Yeah, the, I don't belittle that, you understand. And if in the, in the providence of God I wind up there, I'll be very happy about it, I'll tell you that. But that's not my hope. You know what my hope is now? My hope, that was my hope for several years, but my hope now is to live and reign with Christ. Amen. Now, uh, and I think that's a better hope. Heaven will take care of itself. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, it's, uh, it may be the last place we go. Hallelujah. Amen. But, but, oh, my. Well, I don't, you know, we don't want to take too much candy away from us. Hallelujah. Amen. It's better to live and reign than it is to, if you're reigning with Him, than it is just to die and go to heaven. My first concept was uh, that I'd die and go to heaven, and, and I was just going to rest from then on. Well, at 22, 3 years old, you can't be too tired. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Or to get rested pretty soon. But now that's not my concept. God has opened my eyes. I believe what the teachers taught me. Yeah. You know, I have a saying that the teacher hasn't taught until the pupil learns. When the student learns, then he or she has taught. And they taught me, and I learned. <laughs> they, 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 yeah, well, I, uh, but some of the things, that most of, so many of the things I learned, I had to unlearn them. They're, they're, all right, so the church teaches us to get ready to die, but the Bible's teaching us to get ready to live. Uh, and the church teaches us to get ready to go, and the Bible is teaching us to get ready to stay. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> and yeah, that's right. And uh, well, the, the church is teaching us to fly, and the Bible teaching us to fight. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, who's right? <laughs> uh, I can't go and stay both. <laughs> uh, can't live and die both. I got to make a decision here. I believe the Bible's right, don't you? Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, I, you, I tell you what, if we don't get hold of the Word of God and let it reveal His person to our person, we'll still be doing the same thing we're doing now, 20 years from now. Well, uh, some of us may not still be doing that. Uh, <laughs> if I could live as long as my forefathers, I could be preaching uh, 35 years from now. 
My dad lived to 97, and if he'd have been a preacher, he could have preached up to four hours before he... <laughs> Hallelujah. That don't guarantee me anything, but I like to think about it anyhow. <laughs> I, I think I've got some heritage that goes beyond that. All right, let's look at this five-fold ministry some more. He gave some apostles, some prophets and past, uh, evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. Now, this is what the ministry is for, is to perfect the saints. Perfect the saints. Well, what, 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 I mean... What's the use in perfecting them if we're just going to teach them to die? To <laughs> uh, well, all right. And uh, we won't press too heavy. And um, all right. Now, what's for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry? Who's going to work the ministry? The saints. Saints is going to work the ministry. Somebody says, well, yeah, I'm moving the gifts. I got the gift of prophecy. Well, that's all right. That's good. That's That's great. He that prophesies is greater than he. How many of you have spoken tongues? Uh, uh, how many of you have given a message in tongues? How many, hold your hand up again, have given a message in tongues? How many of you with your hand still up have ever uh, interpreted? You've given a message in tongues, but have you interpreted? All right, there's few. Well, I know you have interpreted, Brother Golden. All of you have interpreted then. All right. If, all right, then, how many of you have moved in the gift of prophecy? Yeah. Well, all right, if you have moved in the gift of prophecy, you, you know, we use a statement, that terminology, I, I have the gift of prophecy. Well, I mean, I relate to that terminology. I'll agree to a lot of terminology that I don't, I mean, that technically I know is not right. But we have received, uh, the gift of prophecy has moved to us. Now, what should we do? Uh, as 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 saints in the church, in the true church, what would we do with that gift of prophecy? We we activate it or allow it to be activated by the Spirit until it becomes a ministry. Then we have a ministry of prophecy. But we're still not a prophet, you understand. There is a difference in an office prophet uh, and, uh, and prophecy, even though it be a ministry that has developed uh, tremendously uh, through the gift of prophecy, uh, is still not a prophet. And it's designed to uh, edification, exhortation, and comfort. Whereas an office prophet can give directional prophecy. But anybody moving just through the gift of prophecy, even though he has developed a tremendous ministry in there, still shy away from directive prophecy. And you will be, um, uh, you will be fortunate to get to do that because, who, I mean, personally, I don't want to direct anybody's life. It puts a great responsibility on me uh, when somebody comes to me and says, I want direction. You know, now I gotta, I've got to hear from God, because I may send them to Mexico when they ought to be going to <laughs> Australia. <laughs> I may be sending them both places when they ought to just go home. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. But I, I have to know uh, that I'm hearing from God, don't I? Now, I tell you, there's a lot of fickle prophecy has been, uh, has moved into the, uh, to the gatherings. A lot of prophecy that just comes from the spirit of people. Never, um, uh, the intentions of the people are, are generally honorable, and their intentions are good, but they simply just don't have a word from God. And they try to give each other directive prophecy, and it just ruins lives. And, and it's, it's not good for the church. It's out of the realm of divine order, missing God a million miles, and, and with good intentions. Never been taught. A lot of people hadn't been still long enough to be taught. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, the charismatics, they, well, they... <laughs> they rarely have been still long enough to be taught. We need to, uh, well, uh, what, what do we need then? All right, we need to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 28. He has set some, he has set 
some in the church, first apostles, then uh, prophets, and then teachers. He says, he set them in there. S-E-T. When you see the word S-E-T, that means somebody else done it. Yeah. Uh, if, if, if I am set, somebody else done it. If I do it myself, I'm sitting. That's spelled different, isn't it? <laughs> a, lot, a lot have S-I-T in the church, but, but we need to be S-E-T. Hallelujah. In, in, in the church. Hallelujah. Amen. And under, uh, under the ministry, under the 5 O submissive to the 5 O ministry. I was teaching on submission up in West Virginia one time, and I had this, uh, I just read all the scriptures that pertain to submission, and of course, it got around to women submitting to the husband. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, uh, so finally, but I didn't, I didn't deal with that, I just read it, and, uh, and then I, uh, I mean, I'm not crazy. <laughs> uh, well, I just read it, and then I went ahead with my teaching, and, and as was customary back then, I opened for questions. And this one lady got up back, well, halfway back, and she said, Brother Harris, are you saying that women has to be uh, submissive to men? And I said, well, uh... I just read where wives should be submissive, had to be submissive to their husbands, uh, and uh, that the man is, uh, you know, uh, is over the woman, uh, and um, and she, uh, so she fired another one at me uh, right quick uh, on submission. Does she have to submit to? And uh, and I'm not going to submit, she says, and. Uh, and then she said, and I said, well, uh, sister, has it ever occurred to you or have you ever thought of the possibility that you might be just a little bit rebellious? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that ended that discourse. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, all right, so for the work of the ministry... And what's the work of the ministry supposed to do? Here we already said, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Who is the body of Christ? We are the body of Christ. And, um, and, and the 5 ministry is perfecting the saints. It's, the 5 ministry is given by Him, by the blessed Lord, to perfect the saints that they can perform ministry, administer ministry, uh, that will edify the saints. The body of Christ. That's very simple, isn't it? I mean, it's simple foot. It's just that simple. Now, the next word, uh, the next verse, we have a time word. Until. How long is this ministry supposed to be in effect? Here's the answer. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Did you know uh, there is a great spirit of deception in the land today? Uh, and if the many people are hiding behind denominational barriers, many people are following a personality. And once we get into those, into that mentality, we're wide open uh, for continual deception. Uh, and we'll be deceived into uh, oversleeping our rights and our potential. Uh, and when the thing all winds up, we'll be caught uh, in, um, uh, in that system. And, and whatever befalls the system will befall us. Uh, if we're there. You remember Jonathan and the beautiful revelation that he had uh, concerning Saul, his father, and David, his friend? And he had the revelation that David had the anointing. Saul had lost the anointing. Saul was the old order, and God was raising David up to be king. Uh, and Jonathan um, uh, admired David so much that he, uh, Jonathan was the crown prince. 
You know, he was crown prince next in line to the throne of Saul, but he relinquished to David and said, uh, you be king and let me be the secretary of state or, uh, or your right hand man, whatever, next uh, in order. And, um, and, and he tried to befriend David. What he tried to do, he wouldn't leave the system. Saul had a new planted, established system and he wouldn't leave it, though he had the revelation uh, that God was no longer with it. I tell you, uh, Brother Reggie Fulman was using uh, an expression that he used several times there uh, about certain uh, ministry, and he said, they know more than you think they know. And he was right. There are more ministry uh, that knows more than they're telling. Because, I mean, after all, God has moved through the spirit of revelation, and he's moved on them, and they have the revelation uh, that there's a David company out here. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, and uh, they, they have the revelation, but they will not, they simply cannot get loose from where they are because of their system. They got a retirement. Then, I mean, you've got 20 years retirement here. I just, in, in 10 years, I can retire. Uh, well, I can understand all, I can understand a lot of that. And for various reasons, like Grandma belonged to this church, and, and, and you know, uh, you know all the answers. That was the way that Jonathan was. But when it come time for God to write finale uh, on Saul's kingdom, when they nailed his hide to the barn door, they nailed Jonathan's right beside it. Beautiful man with a beautiful revelation, beautiful spirit, but he just stayed too long. He had every intention of breaking out, coming out. I tell you now that you're looking at a come out of the come outers. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, I, I, I do not hesitate to follow the Lord if I know it is the Lord. Now, I tell you, I don't, I don't do anything hastily. I have to know that the Lord... It's not always easy to know the voice of God. It's not nearly so fickle as you... as it is portrayed. Everybody is getting a word from God. Uh, the Bible says to Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to him and said, Jeremiah, rise and go down to the potter's house. Uh, the Bible says to Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to him and said, Jeremiah, rise and go down to the potter's house. Jeremiah 18. Over 1,800 times in the Bible, uh, there is the equivalent of the statement uh, that somebody is receiving a word from God. Hallelujah. But a lot of times we don't know whether we're receiving a word from God or not. If uh, God tries us, doesn't he? Hallelujah. He tests us with the word. I, I don't know, you know, I, I've, I've been, I've ministered in the, all, to all of the holy people, you know, and the, those super spiritual folks that, that they wouldn't go, couldn't go get a loaf of bread till the Lord tells them to. <laughs> now, I've heard them say that. The Lord told me to go. Well, the Lord just, I guess he's neglecting me a little bit. He just doesn't take care of those primary details for me. But I got sense enough myself to go get a loaf of bread without anybody telling me to. I don't have to have the word of the Lord uh, to do just ordinary things that you do every day. Hallelujah. He knows I've got sense enough to take care of that. But I, when I hear the word of the Lord, by and large, when the Lord speaks to me, he puts me on the spot. I mean, he can put the pressure on you. He can turn the heat up. There's a lady down in Houston that uh, composed this song. I don't know, Linda, you might be interested in this one. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of comical, but it's kind of true, too. Uh, I believe the title of it is Caught Between the Fire and the Griddle. <laughs> I, I forget what the words are, but I think the, the, the theme is that if she runs, she's had it, and if she stays, he's going to turn the heat up. <laughs> so she's caught between the fire and the griddle, is the course. And, and, and uh, sometimes it seems that way, doesn't it? God, how about this old boy? 
Who has believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. But surely he hath borne our grief and carried our sorrow, and we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquity, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we were healed. We all like sheep have gone astray and turned every one to his own way. And the Lord laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, but he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? He was cut off out of the land of the living, and for the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because in him was no violence, neither with deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When he hath made his soul an offering for sin, he shall see the seed, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and bared the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. That was Isaiah. Isaiah... <coughs> Oh, uh, some seven, eight hundred years before the blessed Lord, the baby cried out in Bethlehem. Isaiah spoke these beautiful poetic truths. Under the old English law, before fingerprinting became a positive uh, a means of identification, four marks was enough to, to satisfy, four marks of identification was enough to satisfy the old English law. Isaiah, almost 800 years before the baby cried in, Ab uh, in Bethlehem, lifted up his voice and placed 27 identifying marks on our blessed Lord. Hallelujah. Now, he had to be hearing from somebody. He had to be hearing from a, uh, from a power more knowledgeable than Isaiah was, more knowledgeable than anybody in the universe was. He had to hear from God, and because he heard from God, he could, ah, behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a, a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Oh, to who's speaking? God speaking it to me. God speaking. The men of old, they, ah, hallelujah. Amen. You had to know. You, well, why do you think that John said, try the spirits and see if they be of God? For he said, there are many spirits going out, and all of them are not of God, didn't he say? Amen. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice, and the voice of a stranger, they won't follow. But I tell you, there are many that are following a strange voice tonight. There are many voices that are vying for the attention of the Christians uh, that are, you know, uh, that are encamped in the world. Many personalities saying, come over and help us. But I tell you... Hallelujah, what we need to do according to the scriptures and according to uh, the revelation uh, from God to my spirit is we need to seek God until we get a definite answer and a definite setting. Hallelujah. Amen. Everybody doesn't just do it. is not within man to direct his own steps. And if you try it, I'll guarantee you uh, that you'll make shipwreck. And so we wait, wait on the Lord, and be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. <laughs> ah, yes, you see, I know that, that the, uh, the, the, this last move, they talk to God a lot. Uh, I've heard them call him Big Daddy. <laughs> oh, my. I... Uh, uh, somehow or another, that doesn't set well with me at all. Uh, somehow or another, that gives me about the same feeling it does when I hear that joker's burning that flag. Hallelujah. 
it is irreverent to burn that flag. It's, it's disrespectful. It's, it's defiant. I think it's irreverent to, to refer to the Heavenly Father's daddy. I heard one charismatic testify, and he said, I said, hello there. Oh, I mean, pressure was coming down on him. He was two car payments behind, and they was threatening to repossess. And he said, hey, Daddy, Big Daddy. No, he called him Big Daddy. Big Daddy. Well, if he's Daddy, he's big. Uh, big Daddy, uh, up there, I'm in trouble down here. i got to have two car payments. And Big Daddy said, all right, little Joe, let's go to the post office. It'll be there. Now, I don't remember whether he told about going to the post office or not. But there's one thing that I'm sure of is that he didn't hear from God. And, uh, and if he were to hear from God, he wouldn't know it. Uh, <laughs> amen. Uh, and that God is not in the business of carrying on fickle conversations like that. Now, I'll tell you now. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. He is, oh, he is interested in directing us, and God will, oh, don't misunderstand me, and I know that you won't. I believe that God speaks to us. I know that he speaks to us. I am one that he speaks to. Hallelujah. Uh, and many of you, or perhaps all of you, but, but you just don't have those kind of conversations with him, I mean, you know, he's the heavenly father. Hallelujah. And we're just one of the children. And that very uh, small and insignificant, too. I'll tell you, except what he places, uh, there is nothing else. Oh, yes. He placed this fivefold ministry in the church for, well, what is it, five? All right. Now, for, to perfect the church. All right. I ask you then, can the church, as the world knows the church, can it ever be perfected under the perfect si under the present system? The answer is no, because not uh, most of your church structure will not accept but two of these ministries. They accept the pastor and uh, the evangelist, That's the, and uh, and possibly the teacher, but they will reject the prophet and the apostle, and it is up on the foundation of these two ministries. Uh, that the church stands and is built, and that we're building upon. It can, they cannot be perfected until they accept the ministry of the apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastor, and teacher. Because the reason is, and I get ahead of myself, but I always do. Anyhow, I'll come back and pick up somewhere, and and, uh, and perhaps you wonder what I was trying to do at twelve. Uh, all right. And uh, uh, what is this fivefold ministry? It is the Lord. What did he do? When he ascended up on high, he gave gifts unto men. He gave himself. Did you know that in the opening chapter of the Bible uh, that God has everything fixed just like he intends to fix it to the sixth, to, to the Seven dispensations. In Adam, he had it all fixed. He had a man in his own image over all the works of God. You get that? He had a man in his own image. It so says in the 27th verse, 26, 27, 28 verse. says he had a man in his own image, and he had dominion over all of God's works. That's all God plans to do in seven whole dispensation, uh, and this being the sixth of the seven. <laughs> he plans to, <clears throat> at the end of the seventh dispensation, have a man uh, in his image with complete dominion over all of God's works. Now, but only this time, that time it was Adam, but this time it'll be the last Adam, and the last Adam will be the head of a many-membered corporate body, and this will be the man. It is the sons of God, if you please. The reason God couldn't leave it like it was with Adam uh, is that Adam was, uh, was perfect by reason of innocence. <clears throat> and that's not what God wanted. He wanted perfection by reason of overcoming. 
Well, Jane, <laughs> that's a difference, isn't it? By reason of overcoming. Hallelujah. We're not innocent. We are overcomers. God wanted us. Oh, the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who subjected the same in hope. Oh, that blessed hope. He, uh, so God, uh, while Adam was perfect, but he, he was perfect because he had never, he'd never been exposed to any thing that would corrupt him. He was, he was incorrupted, but he was not incorruptible. We're going past incorrupted to incorruptible. Hallelujah. Uh, hallelujah. Uh, we, somebody has to do it. Somebody has to do it. Somebody has to do it in this age. A lot of somebody has to do it in this age. Somebody has to walk in the life. Has to tread under feet all of the obstacles and walk right in the life. While yet in this tabernacle. And I tell you now that I'm a candidate. Hallelujah. Amen. And if you... If you have the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you can announce your candidacy. I've already announced mine all over the world. I've, I've been announcing it for years, that I am a candidate to walk into life. Hallelujah. In the 14th chapter of Revelation, 144,000 does it. And, uh, and I'm a candidate to be one of them. But I tell you what, that's not the end of it. As soon as that 144,000 walks into life, that it is the bona fide, no, it is a God-given guarantee that there is a bountiful harvest out there. Amen. And we'll, uh, behold, I show you a mystery, Paul said. We shall not all sleep or die. Word means die, doesn't it? But we shall all be changed. I find myself agreeing with folks. Uh, you know, I said I agree with people because of, of uh, terminology, but I know, technically, I know different. You know, like, I preached a lot of funerals. I preached over 700. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, I never have learned just how to control the breed or just what is the correct thing to say. So usually I just say, if I approach the son, I say, I'm sorry you lost your dad. Oh, I'm sorry your dad died. And he'll reply, well, Brother Jack, thank you for coming, and, and uh, Dad loved you, and, you know, the, and the usual thing. And he says, but we all have to do this. And, you know, most uh, generally I just agree, yeah. But see, you don't know any better, but I do. <laughs> uh, oh, don't have to do it. Well, I'm not standing here saying, somebody says, you know, they, we used to have a lot of friction over never die. Pre You've heard never die? Everybody heard that expression? Well, I'm not an ever die preacher. I'm just preaching living forever. <laughs> oh, look. <laughs> there is a difference. There is a difference. I can tell you what I believe, and you'll believe it too. I, I believe that but I, hallelujah, I believe that if time goes on and I pass my allotted days here uh, and the time element is not right, um, I'll go by the way of the grave. But I believe that if I do go by the way of the grave, I'll come out in the first resurrection. And blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, for over such uh, the second death will have no power. But only the in Christ did arise in the first resurrection. So you've got to get ready to stay. Hallelujah. Somebody said, getting ready to leave. Well, I'm getting ready to stay. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, for the, the Bible says the earth will, the, will never be uninhabited. Hallelujah. And in all, all the tires everywhere, he, he took out the wicked and left the righteous, didn't he? And uh, in Noah's day, uh, he took out the wicked and, and left the righteous, didn't he? He's always looking for, uh, for this new creation. So Jesus, as he ascended up on high, he gave himself back. That's what he did. He, he divided his ministry into five ministries. He divided himself into five ministries and gave it back to the church. 
He gave himself back to the church. It was God's plan. <coughs> You're familiar with dispensations. You know that we're in the sixth dispensation. You know what a dispensation is? A dispensation uh, is a period of time allotted by God in which God will dispense a portion of his life into humanity. And seven is a complete number. So seven, when the seventh dispensation is finished, God will have dispensed his life entirely into humanity. That will be the end of the kingdom age. And uh, the beginning of a new heaven and a new earth <coughs> wherein dwelleth righteousness. I could <coughs> teach this slower and, and you could get it better, but, but uh, believe me, it's all scriptural <laughs> and it's all the truth. I know it by the scriptures and I know it by revelation. I have, I'm not peddling anything. I don't, I'm not looking for any followers. I'm not looking for any contacts. Hallelujah. Amen. I have no motive uh, to preach the gospel except that there's a calling on me. Hallelujah. Amen. I, 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 I've been thinking and I've talked about I'd like to retire from pastoring. Well, from, um, I don't actually pastor, but that's another story. And I, I, uh, I'm filling in. Hallelujah. So we can get one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That, that was an agreement that I made with the church when I started. They voted me in. Pastor, come to the radio station where I was yodeling. <laughs> and told me about it. And I said, oh, no, I don't want a pastor. I've done a little preaching around. No, not a great deal. This around. This is gentleman preachers, what it was. And, uh, and they said, well... Uh, I said, I'll come over tonight and preach for you, and, and I'll talk to you, elders. So I came over, and, and uh, they was insistent that I pastor, and I said, no, I, I don't want to pastor. Really, I don't. And uh, I never thought about pastoring. I don't want to pastor, but I'll tell you what I will do. I'll fill in. I like pastor until you can get one. But now don't you stop looking, because I don't want this to last long. And that was 35 years ago. And sometimes I suspect they done, they ain't even looking for no pastor. <laughs> well, I know. All right. <laughs> uh, I said Jesus divided himself and gave himself back to the church. All right. How? Uh, you, you want me to show you how? Uh, all right. In Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1, he is an apostle. So that takes care of the apostolic ministry for him. Uh, and uh, in, um, in Matthew chapter 24 and 25, he is a prophet. He is foretelling the future. And in, uh, in St. John chapter 4, he is an evangelist. He meets the woman at the well and evangelizes the city. And in St. John chapter 10, he is a pastor, the shepherd. And in St. Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, he is a teacher. He is apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Hallelujah. And he has given to the church this fivefold ministry, which is himself. Now, when he is through with the church, when he has finished his working with the church, and the church has finished its ministry, it will all come together. You see it? It will all come together. And when it all comes together, there he is. He's the head, and this is the body. And he has, oh, well, he's brought it, he's bringing it all back together now, and it is the body of Christ. It is the church, a living organism uh, in the world today. Hallelujah. And, and the only way that we're going to be uh, uh, in the high order of any part of this church uh, is if we recognize the fivefold ministry. What, there, there were two types of apostles, two categories of apostles. There were apostles to the Lamb, and they were limited to twelve. 
They called apostles to the Lamb. That is, they assisted the Lamb to Calvary. Hallelujah. Oh, what a lofty calling. What a glorious reward they have. You know what their reward is? Uh, that they'll have a throne each in the kingdom. They'll each rule over a tribe of Israel. They'll be tribunal leaders forever and ever and ever. They were apostles to the Lamb. But these apostles that Jesus gave, he gives them the other side of Calvary. It's the other side of Calvary now. The, the apostles to the Lamb followed him to Calvary. Uh, and they became, uh, they uh, finished uh, the, that phase of their ministry as apostles to the Lamb. But on the other side of Calvary, when he ascends up on high, he gives back gifts unto men. Now he gives them to the church. So uh, modern day apostles are apostles to the church. Paul was an apostle to the church. Peter was an apostle to the Lamb and to the church. John was an apostle to the Lamb and to the church. But since they have phased out, uh, there are no more living apostles to the Lamb because Calvary is behind us. But there are apostles to the church uh, whom the Lord will keep in effect uh, at least through these seven dispensations. So the calling of an apostle is a very high calling. It is the highest ministry calling there is. And, um, and there, are, there are many in the land today. Most apostles don't go around bragging about being apostles. It's a weighty thing. God speaks to you. And you're not always uh, sharp enough to know if it's God or just a suggestive mentality. You, you understand what I mean? You can have a suggestive mentality. You can have a mentality that is prone to, to, to lean to suggestion. And somebody can suggest something to you a couple of times, and you will accept it. You, you, you know, develop that, oh, God, I, I prophesied that God's sending wave after wave after wave of his spirit. You can be sure that the enemy is doing the same thing. And he's sending a wave uh, that will capture your mentality. Yeah, and make you prone to the spirit of suggestion. And so you just suggest. How do you think all these children got on dope? To the spirit of suggestion. The enemy give them a mentality of yielding to the spirit of suggestion. And so a friend says, hey, you ought to try this. It's really a good feeling. It won't hurt you. I heard that stuff like I'll kill you. Oh, shoot, I've got three brothers. It's, it's 40 years old. One of them 40 years old and been doing it all, all his life. Sniffed everything he ever made up his nose. <laughs> and he ain't hurt. And suggestive. Suggestive. Oh, I tell you, a great task lies ahead of the church that is yielded and submissive to this ministry. Ah, you think this ministry was just birthed uh, here? Well, Paul is speaking of what God has done. But let's turn back over to, uh, for a quick uh, confirmation here, our, our prophetic projection. In the 40th chapter uh, of the book of uh, Psalms, in the 40th chapter of the book of Psalms, verse, uh, well, let's see here. You will have to excuse me, it's the 68th chapter of the book of Psalms. 68th chapter of Psalms and verse 18. Here's, I uh, here it is in projection. Thou hast ascended on high. Thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Here it was projected. When Paul uh, gives it in Ephesians, he is quoting from here, or he is perhaps not quoting from here, he's doing it uh, to a prophetic... Uh, knowledge and uh, to a scriptural knowledge, but he is in reference to this passage. It had already been prophesied uh, that God would 
hallelujah, uh, that he would go into the heart of the earth. How is it that he had ascended is, uh, is the same one uh, that descended into the heart of the earth? What happened? I'll tell you what happened. God moved paradise. Hallelujah. Amen. He moved it from the heart of the earth to somewhere in the upper stratosphere. Hallelujah. And it was when he was moving paradise uh, that he uh, ascended up. Well, shall I give you some scripture here? Let's turn over to Matthew chapter 27 and, uh, and read here in verse 51, I believe it is. Uh, in 51, uh, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent. That is, when Jesus was crucified in the 50th verse, he cried out with a loud voice. He yielded up the ghost. The apostles of the Lamb had brought him to Calvary. They'd come to Calvary with him. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the temple, the, 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 the veil was rent from the top to the bottom, signifying that God did it. He started at the top, ripped it through the bottom. Verse 52, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the grave after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, don't forget that. Let me point out some key words because I want to take you right to another scripture here. All right. Uh, the graves were open, and many of the saints, of the body of saints, many of them, not all, but many, which slept arose, but they didn't come out of the grave until after his resurrection. And then they appeared unto many. Now, let's turn over to, and let me see here. Uh, they... They came out of the graves, and uh, they, they did not appear until his resurrection. Well, let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse uh, 18. For Christ also hath suffered, has once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Well, that's far as I want to read that. I want to turn now to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And I, I, I wrap all of this, try to tie all of this together here. Chapter 11. Hallelujah. And, uh, and verse, uh, the last verse in chapter 11, uh, the last two verses, 39 and 40. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now he's talking about the uh, hall of fame of the he of the heroes of the Old Testament here, many names, doesn't have space uh, to name them all, and he said they died in faith. And these all having obtained a good report through faith, but they received not the promise. They could not be perfected uh, because their perfection was, was going to be provided to another people. And uh, so they went to, what did, what happened to them? They died with a credit voucher. They believed in Jesus. They believed that God uh, would send his son, uh, and that the son would be the redemption of the world. They believed that God would be in Christ, reconciling the world unto themselves. They believed uh, that they had found salvation. And so they, they, they died. Now, I said a while ago, if I should die as before, my, uh, before I make my call in an election, sure, I'll rise in the first resurrection. Now, that's what happened to them. When Jesus died at Calvary uh, and they buried him, he went into the heart of the earth, and he went into paradise, a place uh, that was, uh, and here's where all of these spirits was. 
All of these men that had died uh, with the credit voucher. Hallelujah. Amen. It was not time to cash it, but they had the credit voucher. And, 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 and Jesus, back when I was a boy in the uh, uh, middle 30s, uh, in the Depression, you know, the school there at um, my hometown run out of money. Yeah, I think about everything was out of money. Is, is, um, I remember it because, you know, I was very young at, uh, at that time. I was born in 27. And, uh, and he, uh, they, uh, so they paid the teachers, school teachers, they just give them a dollar too, or five dollars, or, you know, just two dollars. Well, actually, they didn't have a lot of dollars coming back then. And, uh, and they gave them a credit voucher for the other. And the bus drivers, they did the same thing. County workers, they did the same thing. They give them a credit voucher, paid them just a little money, barely enough to squeeze by as much as they could, and let them hold these vouchers. And when the county would get some more money, or the school would get some more money, they would deposit it in the bank. And if you had a voucher, you could go and, and they would honor it. That's what these folks had. They had a credit voucher. And they're all down there in a place called Paradise. <laughs> or maybe it's called by other names too, but uh, it was Paradise. It was a place of rest, place of waiting with this credit voucher. They was waiting for him to come. You know the message of the Old Testament? The theme of the Old Testament, what was the central message? He comes. He comes. The seed of the woman uh, bruises uh, uh, the serpent's head while he bruises the heel. Uh, and so, uh, and um, in the 49th chapter, uh, the scepter shall not depart, nor a lawgiver from between the feet of Judah until Shiloh comes, until he comes. And then comes the Gospels, four Gospels. And what is the theme of the four Gospels? He dies. All of them records his death. Then comes the book of Acts, and he lives. Hallelujah. Amen. I tell you, he comes. Somebody said, oh, I'm waiting for his second coming. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. And I don't want you to get the idea that I don't believe he's coming. I do. I believe in his literal coming. But if he come now to me, it'd be way too late to be his second coming to me. Hallelujah. He has come to this boy uh, a lot of times. Hallelujah. He come to me in salvation. He come to me in healing. He come to me in deliverance. He come to me in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He has come... Ah, uh, he will come. Hallelujah. He will come again, and every eye will behold him. But I tell you, he has appeared unto me on many occasions. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. I have endeavored to learn his voice and to know when he is speaking to me. I, I have needed direction badly, and guidance, and... and uh, you know, and and um, everybody wants a word from the Lord, don't we? we? We want a word from the Lord. But I tell you, now, if he speaks to us, he sure puts us sometimes on the spot. I, I'm going to tell you about an incident uh, in my life uh, at this point that I think is fitting. And uh, it happened a long time back. Some, oh, it's been more than 15 years ago. And that don't mean that I haven't heard from God uh, fresher than that or more lately, but this was one of the most profound uh, visitations uh, that I ever had from the Lord and, and one of the most profound, unreasonable uh, words uh, that the Lord ever spoke to me. One of the most unreasonable, I thought, demands uh, that the Lord ever put on my life. It happened like this. I had some uh, very, very good friends who had pastored a long time, and they had moved to Houston. And, um, and the lady, they were all like maybe 50, in the early 50s, I'd say. And uh, she had been a diabetic and uh, in poor health for some time, but uh, she had a stroke, massive stroke, in Houston. And, um, and they had her just on machines, and the doctor had told uh, uh, my brother um, uh, in the Lord, uh, her husband, to call, uh, to call the boys in. They had two boys. 
And uh, uh, that she wouldn't live till morning, you know. It, it was impossible for her to live with all the massive um, a stroke that she'd had in this diabetic condition, and, and everything was against her. And, uh, and then he mentioned, of course, that uh, it would be best anyhow because uh, if they could keep her alive, even with machines, she'd be only a vegetable. So he called me at home, and he said, Brother Jay, he told me what had happened, and he said, uh, I just wonder if he's going to be around home next day or two. And I said, I, I, I don't have any plans leaving town next um, two or three days. Uh, uh, and he was saying, well, 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 Ruth, he told me about Ruth's wife, said, and when she died, he said, we want to bring her home to bury her. And uh, he said, well, I said, well, I hate it so, so much. I'm, I'm so uh, in sympathy with you. And, and he had already resigned uh, to the fact that she, you know, would, would die um, that night. He, and, uh, and so I, when I hung up the phone, well, I told him, I said, well, I'll pray. And uh, he said, well, I appreciate it, Brother Jack. And, uh, just pray that uh, I'll call you back in the morning and let you know, you know, what, the, what to do, these, what the arrangements were, what he said. And uh, so I, uh, uh, when he left, I mean, when the call was over, I called my wife, and uh, she was home, but I just got her attention, told her what had happened. And we called another, uh, a lady from the church that often prayed with us, a real power warrior. Uh, and uh, we were back in my study. It was on the, in the house. We still lived out in, in, on the farm at that time. And, uh, and I had a study on one end of the house. It was kind of, it was real private, and, and yet it was in the house. And, uh, and, uh, and we was down there praying, and we just got the uh, interceding uh, for this sister. And uh, and I just laid down the floor. Like sometimes I walk, sometimes I lay in the floor, and sometimes I kneel. And I can do it from any position, and I can just pray from anywhere. And and then my wife laid in the floor, and the other sister, but we just all three was laying in the floor. Just and and this was long, all about about nine o'clock. That I that I knew that we were down in the floor, and we were, and then I lost. I just lost all um, awareness of, any, of everything. I lost all awareness of everything. And, uh, and along about 12 o'clock, well, the sister gets up to go home at midnight. And my wife goes on up there in the house and goes to bed. And I am aware of that. And then I lapse back into just an unawareness. And it was 3 o'clock in the morning when I woke up. And when I woke up, I wasn't on the floor, but I was at my desk, sitting in my desk chair, and I had in my hand a letter. And I had an envelope addressed to the hospital down Houston, room number and all. And, uh, and I had uh, two pages of, uh, you know, of 8 by 11 in longhand. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, so I looked, and I wondered, well, what, where am I and what am I doing? And, and then I seen what I was doing. I was stuffing this letter into an envelope. And I thought, well, I'm sending, I looked at the envelope, and it was addressed, I said, I'm sending Brother Hines a, a, a letter. So uh, uh, now, then I realized I didn't know what the letter said. So I thought, uh, you know, I ought to know what it says. <laughs> So I, uh, I opened the letter, and I read, and the first paragraph was just an introduction, and then in the second paragraph, I come out with, Thus saith the Lord, I'm sending you the word of life. Yeah. And, and, and Sister Ruth will not die, but she'll live. And she won't just live overnight or for a week or a month, but I tell you, saith the Lord, that she'll live to see the third generation from her body. And not just an infant, but she'll live to see the third generation from her body call her granny. Her oldest 
grandchild's about 10 years old, and he's the second generation. So you can see what I've done, you know, what the Lord done. But we have projected her life for another 10, 12, tw at least another 12 years. The way I figured it, and I was figuring it too. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, I said, Lord, did you speak to me? And, yeah, I didn't get no, I didn't hear nothing. I didn't, I didn't hear no answer. And I said, Lord, I know that you spoke to me. I, 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 wrote, I wrote this. It's obvious that I had written it. This is the end of part A. Please play part B. Thank you. Our website is www. Lake Hamilton Bible Camp dot com and LHBC online dot com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you. For tape, CDs, DVDs to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is now the conclusion of this message from Part A. It's of the evening service of July the 5th, 1990. Summer Family Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Jack Harris is the speaker of the evening. And I said, Lord, I know that you spoke to me. I, 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 wrote, I wrote this. It's obvious that I had written it. And, uh, and I said, oh, let me, uh, this is what I said in the letter. I said, when you receive this letter, then I addressed my brother. And I said, Brother Hans, when you receive this letter, sister won't have shown any signs of life. But don't let that disturb you. Just pull your chair over beside her bed and read it in her ear. And when she hears it, it'll bring life. I declare it. I decree it. Hallelujah. And, and then I thought, boy, am I going to mail this? And if I do, well, I, you know, if it don't come to pass, you know what the Bible says about that. Huh. Now the thing for me to do is, see, I'm 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 not too prone to to be to yield to suggestions, but there was something making some suggestions to me, <laughs> and 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 the first suggestion I got was, don't be a fool. You, if you've got to say this, call him on the telephone and say it. And then if it don't happen. There was a misunderstanding, you see. <laughs> but this way, we'll have it in writing, and we'll show it to everybody. Uh, well, hallelujah. Amen. So, so I, uh, I, I, I thought, well, I don't know. Uh, well, uh, oh, then I come up with a brilliant idea of my own. The mail carrier out there where we live didn't run until 2 o'clock in the evening, and he's going to call me in the morning. So I'm going to go put this in the mailbox. And when he calls me in the morning and tells me she's dead, I'll take it out. <laughs> if bad comes to worse. <laughs> well, so then, then I thought, no, that wouldn't be an honorable thing to do. And uh, I believe I got a word from God. I, I believe I have a word from God, but I need to know that I have a word from God. I mean, you know. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking contrary to, to medical science and, and to everything, so I need to know that I got a word from God. So I, uh, my Bible was laying on the desk, and I reached and opened it. And I opened it in Second Peter chapter 1, and my eyes fell on verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, if you need more than that, you're a hard head, sure enough. So I, I, I dropped it in the envelope, licked it, and sealed it, picked up my car keys, went out to the garage, got in my car, and drove town. 
curled up post office up. They got a night delivery box out there on the cement post. And once I drop it in there, I can't recover it. And the man's going to come by in less than an hour from now and pick it up. So I drove up there, got out with my letter, went around there and pulled up a lever down, you know, and laid my letter up there on top and, 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 and turned the lever loose. Ain't nothing I can do from here on. It's, it's in the Lord's hand. Turn out now. Uh, and, and so, you know what happened? An hour after I left that thing there, there was a, a van truck pulled in there, and a guy got out with a mail sack, went and held it under that thing, took the key and unlocked it, and dumped the living word right down that old mail bag. And he headed north toward Longview. Uh, and he took it to that big post office where they got all of them uh, lanes and dropped that thing in a hopper and it went down a south main bound lane and it dropped out in another hopper down under about as twice as far as from here to the end of this building and another guy pick, uh, picks up that hopper, dumps it in a mail bag and takes it out to the airport at Longview. And about 7.30 or 8 o'clock the next morning, that mail plane come right over my house every day. Going from Longview to Houston, taking the mail from, from the uh, north that had come in Longview, uh, that was Houston down. And, and I was up in the, I had walked up in the, uh, in the field there, and I looked up and seen that plane coming. I said, that's that mail plane. He's got my letter. He's got a living word on there. And he took that thing to Houston, landed that plane about 8.30 that morning, or uh, 9 o'clock. Uh, and dumped that in a hopper, and it run down one of them fingers and turned it into a local lane, dropped it in a basket down there, and a walking postman come by and picked it up and put it in his leather pouch and carried it out there to the hospital and handed it to my brother uh, and the Lord. And he looked at it, and he said, got her bra ah, six hands are still laying there, just as dead as she had been since she had the stroke. No sign of no life, and he read it, and then he pulled his chair over to her head and said, got a letter from Brother Jack. I'm going to read it to you. And he read the letter, and when he got to paragraph 2, <clears throat> it said, I read this in her ear. When she hears it, it'll bring life. She'll live and not die. And she opened her eyes and said, the Lord is my shepherd. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, of course, that was real thrilling. The three days later, she walks out of there. And, uh, and a month later, they come back home for a visit and come to church on Sunday. But, I mean, everybody is so thrilled because they knew about my letter and what a prophet was among us. But... <laughs> <laughs> but here I am thinking, 12 years out yonder. <laughs> I say when God speaks to you, he tries. Yeah. Well, uh, time rocked on, and about uh, eight, nine years after that, got a call uh, from this sister, and she said, won't you come down to Houston and marry my grandson? <laughs> He's getting married, and wants you to do the ceremony. <laughs> Hallelujah. And then so, so we went to Houston, and and uh, performed the ceremony, and um, and about uh, oh, about a year and a half later, we was coming through Houston. Said, "Boy, said, no, we got to go by and see." And so we drove by there, and after the first howdy do's, you know, and all the preliminaries, the next thing that sister done was we went to her purse. You know what she's going after? Picture. <laughs> and you know what that picture was? It was the third generation from her body. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. And about 11 years or 12 had passed. And I was here. Glenn, you remember? I was here about three years ago. And they called me to come and do her funeral. And, and it was brought ever so alive to me as I stood out by the grave. It was an old family plot. Uh, and as I stood by the grave, this little grandson, but then she has about three grandchildren, but this little grandson ran right up to me and almost fell in the grave. And I reached, you know, I reached and caught him by the shoulder and, and uh, studied him and supported him. Uh, and I seemed to hear uh, the Spirit say, that's the third generation. 
Hallelujah. Amen. It was all true. It was a word from God. I mean, it was a word from God, and it tested this old boy's faith. I'll tell you it did. It, uh, I, I don't see how God has been so tolerant with me. I don't. Amen. Here I was trying to doubt God, and, and God was speaking deep truth to me, and, uh, and, and, and establishing life, and prolonging life, and bringing forth another generation just by the word of the Almighty. Hallelujah. I'll tell you, you can't lose with God on your side, can you? Hallelujah. You can't lose with Him. Hallelujah. So the church teaches us to get ready to die, and I'm saying let's get ready to live. Hallelujah. The church is saying let's get ready to go, but I say that the Bible said let's get ready to stay. What? Oh, you see, the old theory uh, that I once embraced doesn't make even, uh, it just doesn't make good reasoning. Why? Why all the training unless we're going to do something? I mean, there's no use in tip-top training uh, a person, and then about the time the battle starts, uh, <laughs> hallelujah, uh, just discharge him, and let somebody that hasn't been trained stay to fight the enemy. I tell you, it's not. Somebody mentioned to me that they'd read somewhere that we might be in the tribulation maybe 40 years. And I said, I reject that theory because... I wouldn't reject the theory if you were to tell me I believe we've been in the uh, tribulation for two years. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't exactly embrace it or reject it. I'd just, unless the Spirit bore witness to me, I'd just say, well, that's possible. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, that could be possible. But I know that it's not possible that we've been in what is called the tribulation for 40 years because uh, after three and a half years of what is called the tribulation, of which there's no distinct time for, uh, for us to determine when it started, but there is a, determine, a distinct way to determine when the great tribulation starts. And that's only three and a half years later, so we couldn't have been in the tribulation more than three, uh, less than three and a half years, because the great events haven't taken place. You know what's going to take place? The sons of God are going to be manifested. What the whole creation has stood on tiptoe for is going to be, uh, uh, is going to be, well, praise the Lord. Let me read us another scripture here in Revelation, and and uh, I, I know that we are, hallelujah, <clears throat> if I understood the old theory right, somebody says, well, you know, you know I don't never, I, I don't get up and say, you know, like Speed Wilson, he's got a reward, hasn't he? One of them pamphlets back there and other places, he offers $10,000 if anybody proves it. There's a rapture. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, you know, rapture, it's not a Bible word, but rapture it means more than one thing, but it means primarily of being lifted up or uh, exalted or, uh, you know, or caught up. Or It could mean uh, a lot of those things. Uh, the, only, the thing that I disagree with was the concept and the theory as I understood it, uh, that they were saying to me that everybody that was saved was going to be taken out uh, and then the tribulation was coming. Uh, and if, that's the th uh, if that is the theory, then I reject it. But I tell you this, if you're just a dogmatic and want to hang on to uh, a rapture theory, well, uh, it's all right. I mean, you know, I don't have any objections to it. And should it take place, I'll tell you what I'll do. If it should take place, you can tell me, I'll give you permission now to tell me all the way up, you was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Well, praise the Lord. All right, in the 17th chapter of uh, Revelations, and we have here, these shall make, uh, in the 14th verse, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now, Three categories here, called, chosen, and faithful. Let's, let's uh, discern this a little bit and uh, interpret it a little bit. They are called, how are they called? Everybody say, of God. God. All right? We're called of God. And we are chosen in Christ. And we are faithful to His kingdom. And these are the ones that are going to make 
Why? But if we follow the theory that the church wants us to follow, uh, all of these would not be uh, armored for war. They'd be going home. I was in the, uh, as you know, I was in the, the World War II, and I, I trained in England a long time. I never was stationed in the United States. I wasn't a garrison soldier. I was a roughshod field soldier. Uh, and, um, and, and I, uh, uh, I trained in England for, oh, for a long time, over a year, no, yeah, over a year. We trained in England for one, to make the invasion. I mean, we knew we was going to invade. And everybody, you knew we was going to invade, if you remember. And uh, we, I was with the uh, crack outfit, uh, elite. As a matter of fact, they chose, when they chose us, we all were volunteers, and they chose us uh, about five times as many as they needed to start with. See, all are chosen. I mean, many are chosen, the Bible said. Uh, Many are called, but few are chosen. All right? Uh, the called, all right, all are called. The call has gone to everybody. But the choosing comes after the testing. You get this? The choosing comes after the testing. So we train rigidly in the fire troopers, and, uh, and any time that you wanted to quit, if you was with me, any time you wanted to quit, all you had to do was say so. And uh, yeah, I could have you pass out of there in 15 minutes. As a matter of fact, I'd have you out of there in less than an hour. I didn't want you to stay around there and discourage the rest of them. <laughs> you know, a lot of people are not unhappy until somebody tells them they are. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that are content with what they have until somebody tells them they're not happy. And then they, you know, then for the first time, they know, well, I, I ain't happy here. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, praise God. As you know, people at these rules that come in split churches, you know, they'll take people out. They didn't know they was unhappy until we told them. <laughs> ah, well, hallelujah. You know, we, speaking of the fivefold ministry, you know that you remember when the deacons were chosen in the book of Acts? And two of them. Now, you can come up. If you're not in the fivefold ministry, you can be promoted into the fivefold ministry. Not by man, but by God. They chose seven, and two of them ascended into the fivefold ministry out of the seven. You know who they were. Stephen became a teacher, uh, and uh, Philip became an evangelist. And, and four of them just became, they, they were just pillars in the, in the house of the Lord. Never any notoriety, but they were pillars. I'm, I'm led to believe that they were. And one of them uh, made a reputation of infamy, Nicholas. You know what he did? He got a group of followers under the covering of the apostles and let them out. Uh, and taught them uh, greasy grace and so. And, and in the last book, in the book of Revelation, God's still saying he hates them. He hates that spirit, doesn't he? Yeah. All right, so when we were training, we trained, uh, like I say, it was rigid. You had to be tough. You had to be, oh, it was, you know, you had to be, you had to be a big guy to get in. You had to weigh, um, uh, the, the shortest you could be was six feet, and the least you could weigh would be about 212, I think. And, um, of course, you, if you was too tall, like six, I, I think they had a limit like about six four along there, and a limit in weight of about 260 or somewhere. Big, big stout man. And um, it was an elite outfit. They planned on using us to hit uh, elite targets. Maybe, well, just to be honest, if they could get Hitler or any of his big moguls where they knew where they was, and it was in striking distance, we would have been a, what you'd call now a hit squad, but we were called, a, um, uh, well, we were simply called night raiders at that time. Anyhow, we trained rigidly for all of these months, and then they'd come in at night and wake us up, blow a whistle, and wake us up and tell us to be out and, you know, ready to go in 15 minutes, uh, going to combat. And we'd, we didn't know whether it was or not, but we'd fall out, and, of course, it got to be such a regular thing that, we always knew now it's just dry run, what called dry run. But, but along about uh, the 1st of June, they come in there one night, the 44, and they hollered, fall out and be ready to move out in 15 minutes. And you know, I had a funny feeling about that night. 
we fell out and it didn't feel like all the rest of them. We, it, it was darker than usual. <laughs> and they loaded us in trucks. And they went out in the lights and pulled out on the highway and, and told us, don't, don't speak to nobody. Nobody. Well, it was more restrictions this time. And they drove all night, the rest of the night. And, uh, and when they, when morning come, we was in a field with a big old warehouse building in it. And, uh, and they gave us, they assembled us and gave us strict orders to don't, 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 don't make a telephone call. Nobody slip, nobody goes to town, nobody leaves the premises. No telephone call, because there wasn't no telephone there anyhow, but you could have went back down. No telephone calls, no nothing. They try and keep, everywhere we went to them, English girls, would, I don't know how they'd find out where we were, but they would. And they'd come, you know, and, and peep over the fences at these guys that was, you know, courting these girls and, and, uh, in England. And, uh, but we slipped off and left them that time. And you couldn't even congregate a bunch of you and talk. And when I walked in that warehouse, I knew what it was all about. They, because you know what was in the White House? A great big old sand table. It was long as this building is, and about half as wide. And it was a, it was a duplicate a miniature model of Normandy Beach, Omi Hall, and the cliffs with all the gun emplacements. There it was. I knew what it was. I hadn't been there, but I... I knew what it was, <laughs> and and so we uh, we just milled around for a day or two, for about one day, and then they called us in to rally there, and that's when this old Colonel, that Colonel Jones, I tell you a little about him, he's a, a World War One and two veteran, and he says um, he was a rough kind of a guy, you know, and liked to play rough, and he was just to uh, make yourself. Uh, respected for among the guys, you know, and he always carried a, he had been a cavalry officer way back, and he carried one of them old cavalry quirks, and he always hit himself on the leg with it. He'd slap you on the leg with it, too. And uh, he come in there, and, uh, and the, uh, the company commander introduced him. He called us to attention and said, gentlemen, or men, I believe he said, don't call them gentlemen, call them men. Men, uh, this is Colonel Jones. And, of course, he cursed real big and told the captain he'd tell him who he was. And, and he told us who he was. And, of course, I already, I knew him quite well. And, uh, actually, um, it was pretty good, we, a friend as good as we could be with the differential in our ranks. And uh, he was from San Antonio, Texas, I believe he told you that. And he, uh, he said to us, you know what his opening remarks was? He said, men, he said, 48 hours from now, a lot of you'll be dead. He said, so we didn't have, you know, we didn't have no reply coming. We just there. And he said, you see this sand table? This is where you're going. He showed them cliffs. And he said, I want you to land on them cliffs and knock out all these gun emplacements because the, the beach can't be taken with these in place. And he said, now I tell you that the success of this invasion or failure rests on you. And I'm not worried about sending you. He said, you, I wish you'd let me go, but you know how the price is. They won't let me go. If I could go, they wouldn't need but a few of you. And uh, I could do it myself. But he said, I'll tell you this. He said, you are the, here's, what, and I sat there, you know, and I got the feeling so good. He said, you are the cream of the cream of the crop. You are the best trained soldiers in the world, barring none. You are second to none. You will find the enemy is tough and he is determined. But you are superior to him. And I want you to get up there and clean them gun emplacements out and, and wait for the infantry to come in come morning. We'll be leaving it. He told us what time. And we left. Uh, that, that was the fourth day of June. And, and as he told us how tough we was, I had the same feeling that I get from the anointing <laughs> sometimes, you know, <laughs> when it makes your curls 
straighten out and, uh, you know, yes. And I felt that old patriotic feel, oh, it felt good. Now, I felt really, man, just show me who all on, ain't on our side. <laughs> and so the morning came, or the night came, evening. We was going to get in there just in time to drop late in the evening so it wouldn't be as noticeable to anybody, you know. And, and we was going to try to take them guns out past and then hold for morning. And instead of meeting fire from them guns on the cliffs, when them Germans came up to meet, we'd already have them reversed and we'd have them turned on them. That was our, our orders. So I had just been, my, my company commander had got himself killed the day before, and I got a battlefield commission to, I was first sergeant, we had uh, uh, the four lieutenants, with, uh, that were second lieutenants over the companies, but they were what we call 90-day wonders, and they didn't want to take responsibility of leading the company. Well, I didn't either, really, but uh, Colonel Jones called me and said, um, he, he, he gave me my nickname, he said, Tex, said, I believe it's up to you. He said, I'm going to recommend you if you'll do it. said, I'm going to recommend you for a, a battlefield commission, and I'm going to commission you to a first lieutenant, so you'll outrank all of them uh, peons that I got over there scared. <laughs> <laughs> and and you'll lead the company. And I said, well, if that's the way you want it, Colonel, I'll lead it. Uh, I'll do whatever you say uh, to the best of my ability. And he said, all right, uh, it's official right now. I'm making it official right now. You're in charge. So we loaded. I loaded my company on four planes, you know, the C-47s, and uh, and we started across that channel. We're really far across there. And it ain't gonna take but a few minutes. And boy, all at once, my scared come down on me. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it really come in. And I thought, well, I guess the rest of these guys are scared too. But it don't look to me like anybody is as scared as I am. I'm, I'm, I'm leading this group, and uh, and I don't know what I can do now. You see, you don't know until you we say, oh, I wouldn't do this, or I wouldn't do that, and spiritually and every other way. We don't know what we'll do. And I was, I was sure questioning my ability as we flew across that channel, and I thought, boy, I, I, I'm, shoot, I'm about to believe I'm a coward. <laughs> and, and I was, uh, my knees done begin to shake, you know. And I, I mean, I was scared. I just confess to you that I was scared. My scared was scared. I was scared. And, and I, but I didn't want to let everybody know how scared I was. This was my hope. It was my hope. I hoped that I could, you know, make a good show. <laughs> In other words, uh, if there were any survivors and they told how it happened, I wanted it to sound good. <laughs> and I didn't know whether I could make it sound good or not. I, I, I just didn't know. And so, we, uh, but I doubted it. I was sure in doubt. I was really in doubt. So we, we neared the objective, and the pilot, uh, he radios me, and he says, uh, we'd all was well acquainted. He said, Tex, you ready? And I said, how far are we? He said, four minutes. He said, in four minutes, I'm going to start the countdown. And I tell you this, Tex, he said, I want you to get your, get, to get your men off of this, my cargo. I want you to get your cargo off of my aircraft. And I want you to get it off in 32 seconds. Anything beyond that, and you'll be over, too far over the target. And, uh, and I began the countdown in, well, now he's done talked away about a, a minute of that. So in about three minutes, uh, we talked till he said, in two minutes, I'm going to begin the countdown. And then, uh, and oh boy, now I'm really scared. We're going to come off of there, and they're going to try to kill us. And I've been through a lot of training, but there wasn't nobody, you were really trying to kill me with just simulation, you know. Now they're going to really be after me. And I ain't, but I'm not old enough to, <laughs> to, to die. And so, he says, he said, and when he was close off, he said, is there anything I can do for you before I start the countdown? And I said, yeah. Can you get Colonel Jones on that radio? Because I need to hear him one more time tell me how tough I am. <laughs> well, 
We approached Chris. We, yeah, I knew we couldn't get Colonel Jones. I was just putting him on. <laughs> I just had putting him on. I really didn't need to hear him tell me again. <laughs> and I said, I'd like to hear him tell me just before I step out that door how tough I am. So we, we got over the target, went out, and got on the ground. Good, you know. And, of course, they're, they're shooting at us, and there's a lot of guns there. And, and, but when I, on the way down, I picked me out a big old rock. And uh, that's just there, just a big rock. And I thought, boy, if I get on the ground alive and get out of the chute, I'm going to get behind that rock. <laughs> and so I got on the ground and I run for that rock. I throw it off my chute, run for the rock. And when I got to the, before I could get to the rock, I could see bullets knocking chunks out of that thing. Uh, and I, I suddenly realized that it ain't got no front. There ain't no behind to that rock. And if I don't hurry up and do something else, <laughs> there ain't going to be one here either. And I hadn't been there long enough to establish a front, you know what I mean? <laughs> so then all at once, all at once I got calm. I mean, it just hit me like that fear did. I just became calm and I began to, you know, tell the men what to do and do some of it myself. And... And we meant if the rest of our outfit had done as well as we did, we would have ridded them cliffs of all them gun emplacements. We took out all that my company was to take out. We suffered an 82% casualty before we got off the cliffs, but that was over a period of, of uh, 48 hours. Uh, and that was, uh, that was less than, they, than the brass had calculated that we'd take. And they weren't all dead, you understand. They just... A lot of them hurt. About half of them was dead. Uh, but that's... And after that day, I did everything right. You know what I did? I remembered what I'd been taught. That's what you have to do in this warfare. If you remember what you've been taught, you can war a good war. Uh, Paul tells Timothy to go over the prophecies that have gone over you, boy. And by them, you can war a good war. Yeah, do a good warfare. I remembered what we'd been trained to do, and I, I put it all uh, in in motion. And and throughout the rest of the war, I never was as scared again as I was that day. I was scared from the war, but not nearly uh, so scared. I never lost control. Never again did I lose control, or never again did I feel that I was about to lose control. I had it, and I was glad to know that I had it. Hallelujah. And, and I'll tell you, when this thing consummates and this battle winds up, uh, gets in full swing, I'll be glad, I hope that I can be glad to know again that we've got it. We're victors. Colonel Jones was right. We were the best. Hallelujah. Now, now, if we had about two minutes left before this one began, this spiritual one I'm talking about, if we had about two minutes left, I'd want to see if I could get Brother John on that radio and have him, I want to hear him tell me one more time, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Oh, praise the Lord. I tell you, we're not something to be sneezed at and, uh, and looked down at. We're sons of God. Yes. Hallelujah. We're priests of a royal priesthood. Hallelujah. 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 Sons of God being fashioned uh, in the image of him who is the only begotten. Hallelujah. Amen. It is a lofty calling indeed. Ah, do you wish to meet the challenge? Are you a candidate? Will you try your best to make your election uh, and calling sure? Calling an election sure, I believe it is. 
Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Well, I'll tell you what let's do then. Let's just stand to our feet, lift our hands toward Him. Hallelujah. Uh, and worship Him uh, that is King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. And thank Him that we are alive uh, and we have come to this day. And it is a good day uh, that the Lord hath made. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, 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 amen, amen, and amen. Oh, mercy of mercies, our Lord reigns. Hallelujah. I invoke <clears throat> Heavenly Father in Jesus' name now. I take the authority to invoke choice blessings from heaven for all of this people that are under the sound of my voice. I let you choose the blessings, Father, but I make them the choices. Now I ask you to make them the choices, O Lord. I, I now take the authority to bind this word, to seal it to your spirit and to your heart. Now I pray, Heavenly Father, now uh, that you seal this word to the spirit deep has called unto deep. And if you will seal this uh, word to their spirits, I ask you only to seal that uh, that will be profitable to us in our pursuit of the kingdom. And if I've said anything that was fickle or had no value to the kingdom, I pray that you just have us to forget it before we get out of the tabernacle tonight, O oh Lord. I want only that uh, that is profitable to thee uh, to be preserved uh, in the hearts of your people, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Ah, blessed be the Lord tonight. I tell you now, say it the Lord, that you are a blessed people. You to let your ears to hear uh, the things that you have heard this week, say it the Lord. You to uh, get a vision with your eyes of the things that you have visualized. You to, uh, to be in fellowship hand in hand uh, with such a great people as you are gathered together here with, uh, say it the Lord. For surely the anointing of the Lord is upon thee. You and upon the leadership and the government of this campground. You in the Shekinah glory does enshroud and overshadow, say it the Lord, thou God. Yea, uh, and I have stretched forth my hand, uh, yea, to shower blessing after blessing upon you. Yea, I'll load you daily with benefits. I'll speak to you once, and I'll speak to you twice, yea, that so that it shall be established, yea, and it shall be transpiring, uh, say it the Lord, thou God. Yea, for all that wrote a word of direction, yea, I tell you now, uh, to seek the Lord uh, with an whole heart, and I shall speak shortly, uh, and uh, quickly to thee, saith the Lord, thou God. Yea, and I shall tell thee uh, the desires of your heart, and you shall know that the Lord is speaking to you, uh, saith the Lord, thou God. Only be not diligent and neglect, uh, negligent, yea, but persevere uh, toward the kingdom. Yea, set your sights on Zion, for it is Zion that I shall bring the Deliverers upon ye, uh, that shall come forth with mass uh, deliverance without fail. Yea, and I speak to you not now of a parts realm uh, that you are familiar with, but I speak to you in that which has become perfect, uh, saith the Lord, thou God. Yea, I shall develop perfect ministry uh, in the sons of God. I shall bring you to life and not death, uh, saith the Lord. You shall live and not die, for you are mine. Yea, and I have. I have chosen thee, I call thee out and chosen thee, yea, I have tested and proven thee, yea, and the testing and proving continues, yea, uh, and know that everything that has happened uh, to you has been for the furtherance of the gospel of the ministry, uh, yea, that has been uh, invested in you, saith the Lord thou God, for the Lord your God uh, will do you no harm, yea, but he will aim uh, blessings and goodness and gracious uh, and uh, uh, and amazing uh, amount of grace toward you. Yeah, uh, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Thank God forever. 
Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Glenn. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are many hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.